أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم My dear viewers السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Islam as a religion gives heavy emphasis on the process of learning and acquisition of knowledge In fact Islam rank people based on the quality and quantity of their knowledge. He prefers those who know more than those that do not know. In one of the verses in the Holy Quran, the statement is in repudiating a question where God questions our intelligence is whether those who are knowledgeable versus the uneducated and not knowing are in equal footing. The ayah says, قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِي الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ إِنَّمَا يَتَذَكَّرُ أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ Oh, the Prophet, ask them whether those who are knowledgeable, scholars, are they in equal footing with the uneducated and not knowing people? Only those would realize who can comprehend, can use their mind. In another explicit verse in the Holy Quran, God explicitly says that those who know the scholars, the knowledgeables, have multiple degrees of a preference over those that do not know. The ayah says, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ Multiple steps. The scholars, the knowledgeables, the scientists are in advance to those that do not know, the uneducated people. When you look at the tradition of the Prophet, peace be upon him, the words of wisdom of the Prophet, again, he emphasizes on this fact. The Prophet, peace be upon him, says, أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ قِيمَةً أَكْثَرُهُمْ عِلْمًا وَأَقَلُّ النَّاسِ قِيمَةً أَقَلُّهُمْ عِلْمًا If you want to see the most valuable people, then look at those who are the most knowledgeable. And people with the least value in community are those with the least amount of knowledge. It is not wealth, it is not political and military power that gives value to people. Rather, it is the scope and degree of their knowledge. Their knowledge would set the value of those people and the stature of these people. Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, has again a beautiful word. He says, ma The value of a person is in the what he knows, embedded of the capacity of his intellect and his intellectual power. This is the word of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Look at the Holy Quran. There is a very significant verse and surprisingly significant verse that the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a directive to his messenger, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, who is the most perfect and most infallible creature on the face of the planet. He tells him, وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عِلْمًا Even you, the Prophet, the perfect human being, the most infallible person on earth, still you need to widen the scope of your knowledge. Even you need to increase the level of your knowledge. This tells that the learning process Acquiring knowledge is a dynamic process. It's 
not limited. It is not limited to age, not limited to gender, and not limited to geographic locations. When you look at the Prophet, peace be upon him, he says, Start acquiring knowledge from a very early stage of life, from your cradle, if you can do that, until the last moment of your life. This is the scope of acquiring knowledge. It is not limited only to 12 years in higher school and four years in college and then another four years as at higher education. No, rather the acquiring knowledge, the learning is an ever going process that is continue to go with us until the last moment of our life. Again, he says, it's a mandatory that both men and women would seek knowledge. And then you cannot find an excuse, say that I am in a place that there are not much knowledgeable people. There is not, not many schools, therefore I cannot find knowledge and I cannot seek knowledge. Again, the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, اطلب العلم ولو فصين. Go to China if even that requires you to acquire knowledge. Well, at that time, the farthest land was China. Probably if that was known to people, that people at the time could have an idea about the Oceania in Australia or South America, the Prophet would refer to them as well. But at that moment, people only would recognize China. That much the Prophet has emphasized on acquiring knowledge. Now, what is the best method of acquiring knowledge? Out of all kinds of methods of learning, reading book is the most valuable and the most convenient and easier way of acquiring knowledge. In fact, the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts the divine revelation to the Prophet alluding to the power of reading. Reading the books. When you read, what do you read? You read manuscripts. You read books. Therefore, the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he descended his holy Quran, he started with those beautiful five, five verses. اقرأ باسم ربك الخلق باسم ربك الذي خلق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم Again, multiple times the Almighty uses the word اقرأ Today, the Islamic nation is nicknamed with the word اقرأ It says, أمة اقرأ The nation of reading this is how scholars describe the Islamic nation. Why? Because out of all religions worldwide, the beginning and start of our religion started with those beautiful five verses that emphasizes reading. But unfortunately, when you look at the state of Muslims today, you see that they are far away from seeking knowledge and education. In fact, the Islamic and particularly the Arab countries at the bottom list of the literacy rate when the countries are ranked. Unfortunately, despite so much emphasis in the Holy Quran and in the tradition of the Prophet, the Islamic nations are very behind and lagging behind other nations in literacy Rate. When you look at the universities, despite the fact that the first university and second university were established in the Islamic world, the first one was in 1088 AD in Fas, Morocco, that is called University of Qarawiyun, and the other one, the second one, is Jami'atul Azhar, the University of Azhar in Cairo. Those were the first and second universities in the Islamic world. Afterward, after 250 years, the first university was established in Bologna, Italy. That, that much difference between 
time between the first university that was set in the Islamic world and later on in Europe. But today, when you look at the universities, the advanced and top of the rank universities, you see none of those are in the Islamic countries. Out of the first top 200 university, you do not see a single Islamic university in them. While only United States has 87 universities that they are ranking, you know, top 200. Israel has two universities, but none belong to any Islamic countries. Out of 500 top universities, there are only four universities, two in Turkey and two in Iran. When you look at the amount of books that is published in the, in the countries worldwide, the new titles that get published every year, again, you see that the Islamic and particularly the Arab countries are in the bottom list. The entire Arab countries, almost 40 countries, they publish less than what is published in Indonesia. Indonesia publishes 24,000 new titles every year. The entire Arab countries publish 23,000 new titles per year, despite the emphasis on book reading and handling the books. When you look at the literatures and studies, you see that there are multiple values for book reading. Number one is that it increases the creativity. It increases the power of imagination. If you take a few consecutive hours of reading in depth about any book, that will widen your scope of imagination. You become a better thinker. You will come to see new ideas, and those ideas will be visualized easily. You can visualize those new ideas visually. It will give your power of imagination a big boost. And, and this is how people become creative, especially at a very young age. When you start with your children, teaching them to read more and more books, you see that the power of their imagination will widen. So the first value of reading books is increases creativity and the power of imagination. The second one is that it increases the judgment power. You become better judges when you see a scenario. You will start to discern between the right choice and the wrong choice. And especially when you put yourself in the same scenario. Given that you read a book and you see a similar scenario to yourself, it would be easier for you to judge and choose your way. You become a better analyzer. You will see from your own perspective how you get out of a difficult situation by choosing, by having a better judgment. The third value, it ignites the curiosity instinct within people. When you read more, you will try to explore more about others, explore more about the universe, about the world. Therefore, it ignites this curiosity instinct within people. And this is how people develop. This is people flourish. This is how people flourish. And this is how civilization advances. When you have curious people who go and search and look for new ideas, new things. So this is a third value. A fourth value, reading is the best medicine to boredom. Unfortunately, we have a plenty of time that we don't know how to use. We kill it aimlessly with using, you know, when we use our time on something very futile, on something useless, especially with the technology products, with these iPhones and iPads and iPods and iI and keep saying. So those are the best way to kill our times. Book reading will save us from this idle time that get killed 
when we use it aimlessly, venturing around. The last benefit, beside getting the knowledge, it is studies, scientific studies, evidence-based studies have shown those who are reading more, they are less prone to fall into the problem of mental diseases, such as dementia and Alzheimer. The reason is very obvious, because they keep exercising their minds. The minds keep exercising and exercising. Therefore, they are less prone to have mental problems. These are the five beautiful values of reading books. I should leave you with this important message. When we read, we should be careful that we do not blindly accept any idea. Quran doesn't want you to accept any idea that you read. Rather, you need to think about it carefully and see the reasoning behind this idea. As the Almighty Allah says in the Holy Quran, says, فَبَشِّرْ عِبَادِ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقَوْلِ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ أَحْسَنَةً أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ هَدَاهُمُ اللَّهِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ أُولُ الْأَلْبَابِ Give good news, tidies, to those who first listen, read, they comprehend, analyze, then they follow on the new ideas. So the word of caution, when you read any book, and I encourage everyone to read any book, but remember, do not accept anything blindly until you analyze it carefully. We will come back. اللهم إني أسألك باسمك يا آفر يا ساتر يا قادر يا قاهر يا فاطر يا كاسر يا جابر يا ذاكر يا ناظر يا ناصر سبحانك يا لا إله إلا أنت الغوث الغوث خلصنا من النار يا رب اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد يا من خلق فسوى يا من قدر فهدى يا من يكشف البلوى يا من يسمع النجوى يا من ينقذ الغرقى يا من ينجي الهلكى يا من يشفي المرضى يا من أضحك وأبكى يا من أمات وأحيا يا من خلق الزوجين الذكر والأنثى سبحانك يا لا إله إلا أنت الغوث الغوث خلصنا من النار يا رب يا من في البر والبحر سبيل يا من في الآفاق آيات يا من في الآيات برهان يا من في الممات قدرة يا من في القبور عبرة يا من في القيامة ملك 
يا من في الحساب هيبة يا من في الميزان قضاء يا من في الجنة ثواب يا من في النار عقاب سبحانك يا لا إله إلا أنت الغوث الغوث خلصنا من النار يا رب with the eloquent Dua Joshan Al-Kabir, segment number 40, 41, and 42. Segment number 40, the theme is to mend the bridges and to reconnect. As it goes like this, Allahumma inni as'aluka bismika ya ghafiru ya satir, ya qadiru ya qahir, ya fatiru ya kasir, ya jabir, ya dhakiru ya nadiru ya nasir. Allah, O oh Allah, verily I entreat thee in thy name, O oh forgiver, O oh concealer, mighty, supreme, creator, shatterer, joiner, rememberer, seeing, helper. I have chosen two vocabulary. The first one is the concealer. God conceals the pugnacious things, the misdeeds, the bad deeds and the sins of people. If you remember a while ago in one of the segments we said Ya man azhar al jameel wa satar al qabih He will make the good things known while he conceals the bad things. Satar, when he keeps away and conceal the misconducts. The Almighty Allah has set this universe based on justice. Imagine this universe is a, co a, a courthouse. Eventually on the day of judgment, we will be put on a trials. Now the feature is the feature of a courthouse or a courtroom is that there must be witnesses. This is how a just court should be. There must be witnesses for or against the plaintiff. The Almighty has chosen four witnesses that they will come on the day of judgment. Either they speak for us or they speak against us. Here it is. The first set of witness is the ground that we live on, the same planet. God will make this planet speak on the day of judgment. The earth reveals on earth whatever it has contained. What's wrong with this planet, this ground? This ground will start talking and articulating words. Therefore, they reveal those secrets. This is one kind of witness. The other kind of witness is our body parts, our skins, our hands, our legs, our eyes. Our mouths are sealed while our hands and our foot and our leg will keep talking. They talk to their skins and say, why did you witness against us? They say, God has made us speak. This is second kind of witness. The third kind of witness are Kiram al Katabin, Those two angels that God has installed them on our shoulders that they record every single thing. As the ayah says, وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِظِينَ 
كراما كاتبين يعلمون ما تفعلون those are the angels who write everything and the last witnesses are the infallibles the prophet peace be upon him the imams who come on the day of judgment and they witness on our deeds allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa qul a'malu fa sayara allah 'amalakum wa rasuluhu wal mu'minun mu'minun here means the infallible imams who will witness our deeds and our action again our words was satir concealer god can make all of those four witnesses unaware of our mistakes unaware of our sins if we repent if we conceal the mistakes of others this is how god help us on the day of judgment by concealing our own mistakes and our own sins and mishaps the second words that the almighty allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ya kasiru or the dua says ya kasiru ya jabir but before that caught my eyes the beautiful words of imam hussein alayhi salam in dua arafa where it says ya man satarani min al aba'i wal ummahat oh you god you have concealed my mistakes even from my parents min al aba'i wal ummahat an yasjuruni from reprimanding rebuffing and snubbing me women al ashairi wal ikhwan an yu'ayyuruni from my tribes and my brothers to scold and ridicule me women al salatin and you aqibuni the governments if they find out about my misconducts they will punish me walaw attala'u ya mawlai ala ma attala'ta alayhi minni idhan ma anzaruni wala rafaduni wa qata'uni if they know if they witness what we have what you have witnessed from me they will abandon me they will reject me this is the meaning of concealer god will conceal our sins from everyone going back again to the word ya kasiru ya jabir the breaker and the healer you see brothers and sisters god it break our hearts and the stamina of our hearts by the fear that he instills in our hearts and he rejoins them by the hope by being optimistic and longing for his mercy this is a divine strategy the almighty on one side he makes us fear him on the other side he makes us long and hope for his mercy in one beautiful ayah the almighty says wad'uhu khawfan wa tama'a inna rahmatallahi qareebun min al-muhsinin when you pray to him when you deal with God, always keep this in mind. This is a balanced way. One side is the fear of his punishment. If there is no fear of his punishment, then we do everything. Everything negative, all bad behaviors. But remembering that there is a fear, that there is Jahannam waiting for us, that there is punishment in the grave waiting for us, this feeling of fear make us abstain from sin but that should be counterweight with longing for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we wish and we long for the mercy we should be optimistic always that the mercy of God will contain us in another verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Yahya and Zakaria he says innahum kanu yisari'una fil khayrat they would they would have this relationship of longing for our mercies and fearing our punishment this is how this is an ideal relationship this is an ideal encountering of God's order always we should fear the punishment of God at the same time we should long for his mercy then segment number 41 that is to disperse 
poisonous words. It says, Ya man khalaqa fasawwa, Ya man qaddara fahada, Ya man yakshifu albalwa, Ya man yasma'u al-najwa, Ya man yunqidu al-gharqa, Ya man yunji al-halka, Ya man yashfi al-marda, Ya man adhaka wa abka, يا من أمات وأحيا يا من خلق الزوجين الذكر والأنثى. Again, this beautiful word of He, He created and perfected He who made everything to measure and guide it. يا من قدر فهدا. When He created something, when He created us, He didn't abandon us. The blessing of a creation by itself is a huge mercy to us. But again, remember the maintaining. He kept this maintaining alive. The Imam in Dua of Arafah, Al Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam, says that, Oh, you God, out of your mercy, you didn't even, you didn't give me one blessing while you took away another blessing. You gave all the blessings and mercies. In one package. ثم إذ خلقتني من خير الثرى لم ترض لي يا إلهي نعمة دون أخ دون أخرى ورزقتني من أنواع المعاش وصنوف الرياش. You when you created me, you didn't give me only few of those نعمات and blessings while you took away and deprived me from the other blessings. Rather, you gave me everything sufficient. Complete order. Everything came into order. Creation. Then once I was created in the womb of my mother, you gave me food, sustenance. Then I was brought to this life. You taught me how I stand up, walk, talk, and take care of myself. This is an on ever going process until the end, until death. The blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are ever continuing and continuous. They never stop. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make sure that the blessing continue and we receive those blessings in a continuous manner. He doesn't create us and leave us to our own. Then in other words, Ya man adhaka wa abka. He brings to laughter everyone. At the same time, he brings to wailing and crying everyone. The reasons for laughter is when we are elated, happy, and humorous. When we see a humorous moment, we laugh. When we are elated and full of joy, we laugh. And when we are saddened by something, we cry and wail. What is the reason behind those? It's all in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He made the background conducive for me to laugh or to cry. We should always look at those moments, the behind the scene reasons for our laughter. If he brings laughter to me, I should be careful that one day I will end up crying and wailing because all matter are in his hand. Segment number 42, it says, the theme is to avoid calamity, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya man fil barri wal bahri sabiluh, Ya man fil aafaqi ayatuh, Ya man fil ayati burhanuh. This is that, look at the horizons, look at this universe, look at the planets, look at yourself, Everything that you turn, you will see the sign of Allah is very vivid. Ya man fil quburi abratu, ya man fil qiyamati mulku. The lesson that we take from this life is all in the graveyard. Eventually, we will end up in the graveyard. Therefore, we should search for God's signs in this universe within ourselves within the creation, within the animal, within the nature. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ Because one day we will end up in the graveyard and if we have not acted 
it would be too late to act at that time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us in this holy month, in these holy days and nights, to learn more about these words of wisdom. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. O son of Adam, livelihood is of two kinds. The livelihood which you seek and the livelihood which seeks you. If you do not reach it, it will come to you. Therefore do not turn your one day's worry into year's worry. Whatever you get every day should be enough for you for the day. If you have a whole year of your life, even then Allah, the sublime, will give you every next day what he has disdained as your share. If you do not have a year in your life, then why should you worry for what is not for you? No seeker will reach your livelihood before you, nor will anyone overpower you in the matter of livelihood. Similarly, whatever has been disdained as your share will not be delayed for you.